could say the career of John Waters is kind of like a train. Yeah, I'm sure he would make something delightfully obscene out of that idea. But what I mean is you get on it at certain points, right? And maybe you got on it right at the beginning with Pink Flamingos. Maybe you joined a little bit later with something as borderline innocuous as Hairspray. Or maybe you got on someplace else. The point is he is not only gifted and funny and shocking, but also a very thoughtful person. His writing is maybe what ultimately does distinguish all of his work, except for the visual art part of that. He's got a new novel out. It's called Liar Mouth, a feel-bad romance, his first novel ever. That was an occasion to get him to have a full-length conversation with me on this show. So that's what you're about to hear. You're about to hear John Waters. I'm sure he's been asked every question before, but he's still pretty delightful about answering them. Hi. One of the things I've always believed about this show is that it works best when I can get people to talk their natural way of talking. Now, with John Waters, there are certain risks to that strategy. And in fact, he did use some colorful language. If you're listening on the radio, it's going to be bleeped. We're not going to let you hear it. If you're listening on the podcast, then it's unbleeped and you will hear it. And the good news is that everybody, radio audience and podcast, gets to hear about anal bleaching. You're welcome. That is the only reason I can imagine to play uh, Jump Around by House of Pain, that being the fact that we have John Waters on the show today, and you have to read his book, Liar Mouth, to understand, Liar Mouth, subtitled A Feel Bad Romance, to understand why we might be playing such a song on this particular show. But John Waters, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And it was great you played that song because that's in the book, definitely. Yes, yes, absolutely. But they have to they have to buy the book and yes, read the book. Yes, to understand. Well, yeah. There is a there is a radical trampoline movement in the book that is it must be motion addicts at all times. So that is a song that they play a lot. <laughs> so um, there's so much to talk about, but we're excited. I, I I I hope if I have to explain to this audience who John Waters is, that I feel that something's very wrong. So I'm going to assume that everybody knows exactly who you are. The book, by the way, I don't believe in trying to fool anybody. We're actually recording this interview a little bit of time before the book comes out. So when you hear it, though, you now have the opportunity to go and buy Liar Mouth. So I want to start by saying that you you had a birthday about a week ago, I think, from when we're talking right now. I think that makes you 76. You could be coasting right now. You seem like you're working really, really hard. Is that just something that you can't help doing? Yeah, kind of is. And I enjoy my work. You're right. I'm 76. That's going on 80. I mean, (laughs) 76, I'm not going to be middle age. I'm not going to live to be 152, no matter how much of an optimist I am. So I just think old chickens make good soup. And I don't know. I just keep I just keep going. I love to go to work. I love to tell stories. And I think you only get one life. So I'm here to to meet as many people, tell as many stories as I can on the very limited time I have on this earth. Given your uh, rigorous program of diet and exercise and your strict avoidance of tobacco products, I think you should be fine. You're probably good for uh, another 50 years. Uh, I know I, I did a spoken word show the other night and one of the questions I misheard and I thought they asked me, I thought I have never been asked that question. Someone said, how did you avoid cancer? And I thought <laughs> that I quit smoking. That's the only thing I could think of to say. But what they said was, how did you avoid being canceled? So that was a normal <laughs> question. <laughs> Although I do remember, correct me if I'm wrong, I have this, I, I looked for this clip today and I couldn't find it, but I have this dim memory of you in one of your many appearances on late night television and you were talking about visiting a friend in prison. I assume that was Leslie Van Houten, but you didn't say in this particular thing. And you talked about the fact that you got there. This is when you were still smoking. And I think you said that you weren't just a smoker. You said, I am a cigarette. And then you talked about yeah. how, how disappointed you were that you couldn't smoke in prison because that's kind of a thing, right? 
Well, cigarettes used to be money in prison, but you can't smoke in prisons anywhere. And I don't remember which prison that was. I have many friends in prison that I've visited <laughs> over the years, but I taught in prison for a long time, too. So um, I think I might have said I am a cigarette on the David Letterman show because I did smoke five packs a day. The only thing I regret in life, it's really the only thing I regret. And if you still smoke, you're really stupid. And um, I write down every single day, I have not had a cigarette in 7,054 days. Anybody get a match? Thanks. There's uh, no smoking in this building, Miss Trammell. What are you gonna do? Charge me with smoking? Got a light? Yes, Mrs. Matson. It is so crowded and yet so lonely, isn't it? How did you know? You smoke too much. I've noticed only frustrated people smoke too much and only lonely people are frustrated. So, you know, I've never smoked a cigarette in my life, but I have this odd thing where I like watching people smoke in movies and on television. Like in, in House of Gucci, Lady Gaga, oh, yeah, yeah. Lager, Lady Gaga smoking was very entertaining to me. Uh, but you can always tell actresses and actors that don't really smoke in real life. Totally. Because I just saw Patti LuPone and company on Broadway and she smoked and you could tell. And she said later, I still smoke. You can tell fake, even if you're the best actress in the world, I don't believe it when Meryl Streep smokes because I don't think she ever did. And so I know it's really hard. And as an ex-smoker, and I hate to hear people talk about their addictions. I think it's better than you get rid of all of them. But I was I smoked five packs of King Cools at the end. I think menthol, aren't they trying to make them illegal? They should make them illegal. But uh, it was the only thing ever when I was young, they used to have ads that said doctors recommend cools. Yes. What doctor recommended cools? So I guess it's, it is something that I regret. But in movies, it's crazy. The Motion Picture Association for a while wanted to give all movies that had cigarettes an R rating. And I thought, well, so they're going to wipe it out like movies about the Second World War. Every single person smoked. They're going to take that out. That's crazy for for historical uh, movies has to have cigarettes. in it. But they kind of do that now. I, every once in a while, I'll be watching a movie set in the 40s or the 50s. I'm about eight years younger than you are, eight and a half years younger. So I grew up in the same era. And I'm thinking, well, nobody's smoking in this. This is really weird. Yeah. I'm, and I hate it. I never put people smoking in my movies because of the continuity nightmare. You cut back. And if you want to cut two t- lines of dialogue, their cigarette is 10 pups shorter than it was in the shot right before. That's the reason I never had any character smoke in my movie <laughs> because of continuity. Hello, I'm John Waters, and I'm supposed to announce there is no smoking in this theater, which I think is one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard of in my life. How can anyone sit through a length of a film, and especially a European film, and not have a cigarette? But don't you wish you had one right now? Mm, 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 mm. And I'm telling you that smoke anyway, it gives ushers jobs, And if people didn't smoke, there would be no employment for the youth of today. So once again, no smoking in this theater. (laughs) So let's talk about writing a novel, because this is the first time you've done that. You've written other books. And I know that you've said in the past that, in a way, everything you do is about writing or starts with writing. This must be like writing a movie and then not having to worry about cigarette continuity. Well, it's two different things. It's something you don't have to worry about special effects. You don't have to worry. Well, you used to not have to worry about censors, but these days they're sensitivity editors. But the difference is budget wise, you don't have to say, oh, that would cost like $50 million in special effects to do this or anything. But then there is continuity because you have to go through the whole book and copy editors are the continuity people in uh, in a novel because she has on clothes. She has to have on the same clothes when she takes this off. She has, and she steals so many different outfits <laughs> in the book that it's hard to keep up with it. And, and it has to be believable. It has to be even in this world that I've set up that is completely insane. There are still rules of what people will believe if they accept that universe. You have to make it realistic in that universe, no matter how crazy it is. John Waters, you're not telling me that a sensitivity reader or sensitivity editor went through this book, are you? Because there's no sign that that happened. happened. (laughs) Here's what happened. They do have this thing. and It is the most appalling thing I've ever heard of sensitivity (laughs) editor. Imagine them looking at Pink Flamingos or any of my other films, even Hairspray. So we did send it to one. I had to. And they wouldn't return the publisher's calls afterwards. (laughs) (laughs) 
I guess that was a bad review. Although I did go through it with my editor, my agent, and the four women that work for me of all different ages. And we did go through it as our own version of a sensitivity editor of what is funny and what you can get away with. And since this book does make fun of political correctness in a way, even though I think I am politically correct in a twisted way, we did change things by making it more politically correct so it would be ludicrous and funny. This novel involves uh, well, a protagonist named Marcia Sprinkle, no relation to Annie that we know, and she's a scam artist. She has a partner, Daryl. They are scam artists, and a lot of this starts with the whole idea of stealing luggage in airports. Uh, knowing that for a previous book you dropped LSD and hitchhiked a long distance, I found myself wondering, did you do any of the things that you write? Or you must have had to logistically at least figure out how some of these these griffs would actually work. Yes, definitely. Did I do any of them? No. I, yes, I did. In the beginning, Daryl goes into a department store with a ripped tennis shoe and says he rips it on the escalator yes. and demands money. I did that in the 60s. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes two a day. And it it works. It probably still works. But the worst is when they try to give you a new pair of tennis shoes. Yeah. Daryl um, Daryl gets $200. That. That's pretty good. Yeah. Well, now, are you kidding? Tennis shoes are a thousand. Mm. And then while I was traveling all the time, because I'm always in airports, I did watch and figure out how to do certain scams. I guess the idea came from uh, I have had I was with Pat Moran, my dearest friend. And once she did pick up the wrong suitcase because they all look alike and we're going up the escalator and the man's running after us. And it does happen and it would be easy to do. And I just am mad that they don't have a security person there anymore like they did for 40 years. Everything else got stricter in security after 9-11, but after 9-11, for some reason, they don't have anybody check your luggage tag when you leave the carousel like they used to. Why? I don't know. Perfect time to steal luggage. Yeah, I no, I had my luggage walked away with in that way too, and I just was imagining. You did? Yeah, the ex- I was imagining the extreme disappointment. I got it back, but uh, I mean, they didn't want. Oh, my- but it happened accidentally. Yeah, no accidentally. one actually. Oh yeah, stole it. yeah, it was well, accidental. Well, yeah. Marcia goes in with a fake chauffeur, which right. would really work. <laughs> yes, the, the, you clearly thought through a lot of this stuff uh, and and how to pick off somebody in a TSA line so that you can get their purse uh, and all this stuff. Yeah. No one's ever going to trust you again around any form of transportation. No, I'll probably be on a hot list next time when the book goes out. Every time I step <laughs> in an airport, the security will come out. So we're back in Baltimore, too, and it would be disappointing if this weren't in Baltimore. But I want to talk a little bit about what the city means to you. It's your home, obviously. I feel like it's also a place, there's so many things now, like you go to New York and you go to Chelsea and it's all trust fund kids and OPEC trillionaires and and there's no club called Fist anymore or anything like that. And I feel like Baltimore is still the place that you feel is a little bit closer to a real urban America. Well, it is. Baltimore is my home. It's a character in my movies. The odd things now Since COVID has happened, San Francisco is exactly like Baltimore now. And New York's a little bit like it. Baltimore was always kind of (laughs) fucked up. So basically, (laughs) Baltimore is the same after COVID, but all the other cities are way more like Baltimore now, especially the fancy ones. Yeah, I feel like also there's that whole question of bohemianism and where it can happen. And it seemed as though San Francisco, L.A., New York kind of priced bohemianism out uh, of their yeah, but, environments. Yeah, but in San Francisco, they live in Oakland and, and uh, in New York, they live in Queens. Queens is the new Bohemia, probably. And Baltimore has always been inexpensive to live. It still is. But all the bars that I wrote about, the extreme redneck bars and crazy <laughs> bars that I wrote about in Role Models are all gone. There's not one gone. Even in uh, Pecker, the movie I filmed in Hamden, which is now hipster heaven here, all the locations are gone. Friends of the Whitney, this is Baltimore. <laughs> all right, listen up. There's no teabagging here, and there's no straight people allowed either. Come on now, all of you. I need to see some gay ID. Oh, y'all are out of here. Let's take the gay ID. Take the money, Tubby. Let me have the money, okay? She's all lesbian, all the time. That's vanished even in Baltimore. There's still the Club Charles, which is the granddaddy of them all. That's still the best bar where people go gay, straight, any age, everything that is Bohemia that will always be the center of social life for me in Baltimore. 
So growing up, uh, obviously you had some very strong ambitions. Was writing a novel one of them? Did you see yourself being part of, of Bell Letters at some point? Well, I didn't I did not not think I would do that. Uh, Grove Press educated me, not school. Mm. And I remember reading Genet and Margarita Dura and Alan Robe Grier and all these all these European writers and everything. So I loved them. I mean, I, I love to read novels and I still do. So I didn't not think I would do it. I just I told stories mostly by writing movies, which are, of course, fiction, too. On the day that we're recording this, there's a piece in the Times about how increasingly in the world of fashion, books are being used as kind of signifiers of taste. Dior's featured models walking down a runway printed with Jack Kerouac's on the road. Valentino has tapped authors like David Sedaris to contribute to ad campaigns. And increasingly, now that we've kind of moved to a Zoom culture, too, you see a lot of people sitting in front of bookcases that you kind of know were, were purchased, right? But the thing is, everyone looks ugly on Zoom. I don't, that's why you don't see my picture. I don't do hair and makeup or radio. And also everybody looks ugly and how people have sex on Zoom, I don't know because people, it's really kind of scary. So books, the thing is, if they're sets, if they're just behind you for sets, I don't know, you're right. It's become such a cliche background to think I'm smart. So I have in my Zoom studio where if I have to be on television or something, I go that's not in my house. I have three. I have a green screen, but I have three backgrounds. One is a sort of vintage Baltimore skyline. The other one is all the fan art that people have sent me. And the third one, what is the third one? I'm trying to remember. I'm just going blank to what it is. But oh, it's red velvet curtains. Looks very David Lynch. So those are my backgrounds. But I, I think. I think today that that is how people know each other, what they look like is on Zoom, which is it's creepy in a way. Well, I mean, I've had this odd experience. of I teach occasionally. So last year I taught exclusively on Zoom and I at least kind of knew what everybody looked like. This year, this is a college class. I'm back in the classroom and everybody's masked. So I now have all these people whose faces I would not I could run into them on the street, I would have no idea who they were. And it's, I guess that's a good way of asking you, what is, what has COVID been like for you? You're a people person in a lot of ways. I think you vibe off being on movie sets and having people around you and stuff like that. Well, I know what you mean. I have someone that's only worked for me for about two years and she was hired during COVID and she wore a mask all the time. I don't know who she is. (laughs) I mean, she works for me. I see her every day, but the few times I've seen her without her mask, I'm always startled. Like, who is that? (laughs) But COVID, it was like everybody else. You know, it was scary and terrifying and boring at the same time, as my friend said. And I did travel some. I went to the Rome Film Festival. I have an apartment in New York. So I went there. I went to San Francisco some. I love traveling. Then the airplanes were four people on them. The airports were empty. It was like the Twilight Zone. I haven't been duct taped to the seat yet, but who knows? I'm going on a book tour. That could happen because now with the no mask thing, there's fights both ways. I was in the train yesterday and the woman told me there was a huge battle, a blowout of somebody that had on a mask and didn't. And both sides of the extremes are getting in fights now. So it's going to be more duct taping to the seats. You were in Provincetown when the the famous outbreak happened, right? Oh, my God. I knew it was going to happen. More gay people came than the bees in the swarm. I never (laughs) saw so many in my whole life. And and, uh, it was crazy. It was thousands of twinks. I thought it was a boy band convention. (laughs) It, it, It was pretty crazy. And I knew something was wrong because every bar was packed. And This summer, oh, my God, it's going to be that again. I don't know what's going to happen. There's so many things you fear, like, I don't know, herpes nucleosis or hepatitis Z, COVID. I don't know. What's next? Oh, God. Herpes nucleosis seems like a that, that could be a winner. Um, yeah. Just branding wise, it has kind of a nice mouthfeel. Yeah, it does. It does. And it doesn't sound fatal. Right. We're talking to John Waters right now. His new novel is out. It's Liar Mouth, a feel bad romance. We're going to grab a quick break here. We're going to come back with more John Waters. Good morning. I know you belong to some 
I was I was singing along with that. John Waters is here with us, writer, director, actor, best known for classics such as 1972's Pink Flamingos. He's just published his first novel, Liar Mouth. There, I broke my rule. I told you who John Waters is, although that's barely scratching the surface. So, John Waters, are you surprised? Did you ever think you'd be mainstream? I mean, you know, Pink Flamingos has been added to the National Film Registry by the Library of Congress. <laughs> I, I could go on and on, but it seemed like the original plan was, I, John Waters, am never going to be mainstream. And then they kind of moved the goalposts a little bit. Well, they read because I changed everybody when I was young. Not one person wanted to be called an outsider. Now every person was. So I decided maybe I'd be better to be an insider in the room where it happens. You can cause more trouble. So I'm a little old, 76 to be an outsider. I don't know. Nothing worked after 76 years. So um, I think it's just more irony in a life. I'm an irony dealer. That's what I do for a living. So I think it goes right along with it. I'm flattered by all the attention, but you're right. The fact that the government acknowledged Pink Flamingos as a historic film, when it's worse than it ever was, not better. (laughs) It's more hideous than it ever was. I know because Criterion's putting it out now. And I just, we filmed extras. I had to watch it again. And it was like to see it again was, I thought, oh my God, can you imagine today the sensitivity editor? Does blood turn you on? It does more than turn me on, Mr. Vader. It makes me come. And more than the sight of it, I love the taste of it. The taste of hot, freshly killed blood. Could you give us some of your political beliefs? Kill everyone now. Condone first-degree murder. Advocate cannibalism. Eat shit. Filth are my politics. Filth is my life. Take whatever you like. How's uh, this for a center spread? Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Christ Almighty. And but I did the same things then. I was making fun of hippie values in the hippie world. I was making fun of the politically correct values in the politically correct world. It's the same. I'm making the films of the society that I live in that sometimes has more rules than my parents did. When you look back, the decision of New Line Cinema to throw in their lot with you. Does that strike you now in retrospect? Um, probably at the time, it just felt like, oh, good, finally, I got something. I got, I've got somebody who's willing to, to help and distribute and get my work out there. When you look back from the vantage point of now and thinking about then, does it seem like just an incredible miracle that that happened? Well, I tell you, I read Variety when I was 14 years old. So I knew that that was the right company to go to because they were the first time distributing art movies like Godard and at the same time, Reefer Madness. And Bob Shea ran the company and he went on to run it. He later produced Lord of the Rings. And I owe him great, great respect because uh, he said yes to me always. And uh, without him, he wouldn't have. And uh, I wrote about that in my book, Mr. Know-It-All, how much I don't have any complaints about Hollywood. They treated me fairly, but I was always commercial. Pink Flamingos was a commercial (laughs) underground movie. So I was always knowing about the business. I read Variety. I knew which theaters it should play in. I went out and promoted them. I knew I wanted to team up with him too. And he was the first one that really did exploitation films for art theaters. And that's what I did. I mean, I preparing for this conversation, I thought about the fact that Tucker Carlson has recently been pumping up the idea of testicle tanning. And I was thinking, Wow, that doesn't leave a lot of room for John Waters to operate in if Tucker Carlson is going to be hawking the idea of testicle tanning. Testicle what? Tanning. It's this thing where you tan. Tanning. Yeah, well, yes. That's, that's just a cousin to anal bleach, isn't it? <laughs> I, th- that was exactly my thought. Uh, you, you just stole it right out of my head. Well, speaking of that, though, so Obama at one point referred to the Tea Party as teabaggers. And I was wondering if yeah, you, felt, you felt you deserved any credit for that. I think it's in Pecker that you introduced to many people that particular well, term. Well, teabagging is when male go-go dancers are dancing in the bar and they hit you in the forehead with their testicles. No teabagging. You know the rules. No balls on foreheads. Teabagging is forbidden here at the Fudge Palace. Oh, I'm it right. is a fleeting moment, but it is legal. It's safe. No one gets pregnant or gets AIDS. If it wasn't for you, Pecker man... I never know this shit existed. Teabagging? Jesus, I thought I had heard of everything. Dude, have you ever heard of giving someone a Dutch oven? No, what's that? (laughs) It's when you fart in bed and you quickly pull the covers over your partner's head. (coughs) Oh, man, I gotta try that sometime. The Republicans used to talk about being teabaggers without any irony, not knowing. And I saw Rachel Maddow burst right out laughing on the screen, and she did know what it meant. 
So did Obama know what teabagging meant? Maybe. If there was ever a president, I always try to think what presidents, did any of them see pink flamingos? I bet Bill Clinton did. And I don't know. Maybe, maybe Obama. Maybe. Well, when I th- think of you and presidents, I also think of Harry S. Truman. First of all, both of you have large porn collections, but also uh, <laughs> Harry S. Truman, that whole give him hell Harry thing, somebody yelled at him, at him one time and he said, oh no, I just tell them the truth and they think it's hell. <laughs> and I think that's a little bit what you have done with a lot of your work, right? It's kind of, you and I both grew up in a kind of that Eisenhower era time of ill-advised cheeriness where the whole idea of having a messy life seemed more like a bug than a feature. Uh, People talk about the 50s. It was this fun time. It was a horrible time. And you know, everyone I knew, I like Ike, if I was smart enough, I wouldn't have liked Ike. I didn't know I was 10 years old. I would have liked Adelaide Stevenson, but I didn't know one person that voted for him in the school I went to. It was a private school, so it was everybody liked Ike. And I probably wouldn't have liked Ike at the end, but that was the first time I I, I started to realize that, well, who's the other one that nobody seems to like here that's talking about? And I'm sure I would have voted for Adelaide Stevenson if I was alive then or voting age. But I think when your work started to come out, because it pushed back against those kinds of conventions and against the idea that normalcy was uh, an unspotted escutcheon, right, that normalcy was no social deformities whatsoever, it, I mean, to this day, it must be the case that people come up to you and say, well, you kind of showed me I was okay. Yeah, they do. Uh, yeah. They well, treat me like Mother Teresa. They start crying sometimes, which <laughs> even shocks me. But the di- big difference is today, people say, oh, my parents showed me your films. I thought they did. <laughs> when I was young, my parents called the police. You know, and they just released Cookie Muller's, a lot of her writing, and it got the greatest review in the LA Times this week. So it was wonderful. But her mother used to call me Beelzebub and chase me across the lawn because she found the script for Pink Flamingos. And uh, she was horrified, but... You know, my parents never saw Pink Flamingos. They would have been horrified, too. They paid for it, and I paid them back. But at the same time, what parent would be proud their son made Pink Flamingos? Even today, maybe it would be weird. We did a whole show years ago about the nature of shock, particularly shock in art. And I'd be interested in hearing kind of your theory about, like, what happens when you shock people? If Pink Flamingos is as shocking as you suggest, maybe more shocking today than it was, what's happening when the person gets shocked by it? Well, it's easy to shock people. The people are shocked at their own ability to be surprised by anything, to be startled. They think they've seen everything, but they laugh when they're shocked. They're not repulsed. They don't run out of the theater. I think there's things in liar mouth that will startle you and try to think maybe I haven't thought of that before. But at the same time, I'm hoping you're laughing. I'm trying to use shock as wit, not just to disgust you or ever since Pink Flamingos when I did that ending, which was really a, a hymn to anarchy, really, it's certainly not anything sexual. And it was a reaction to porn becoming illegal. The filthiest people alive. Well, you think you know somebody filthier? Watch as Divine proves that not only is she the filthiest person in the world, she is also the filthiest actress in the world. What you are about to see is the real thing. How much is that dog in the window? So today, I don't know. I'm not, usually there's a lot of critics say it's a very John Waters-esque movie, and I usually hate those movies because they're trying too hard. I'm trying to make you laugh first, way before being repulsed or anything. I don't want you to be repulsed for real. I want you to open up your mind to think of things you've never thought of and not judge others when you don't know the whole story. Well, and that's kind of some of the laughter, too, is, right, I'm seeing this thing I didn't expect to see and wouldn't have thought I could possibly be okay with seeing. And it is shocking me, but I'm also not being, you know, raptured either to heaven or hell. Maybe we're laughing kind of almost out of a relief that we can handle this. Yeah. And if you came along with me, if you bought a John Waters book or go to see a John Waters movie, you're expecting a little bit. You want to be taken into a world that you're a little uncomfortable in. But I'm your guide. You'll be all right. I'm never mean spirited in the long run. You'll get out wiser, I hope, and hopefully with a better sense of humor about yourself. The most important thing to ever have a sense of humor about. So speaking of people who are mean spirited, 
I have to bring this up. You did so right. much to exalt the notion of bad taste. And then finally, we got a president with bad taste. I mean, descending from Mount Olympus on a gold escalator is so John Waters. And yet, I don't know. No, why. I disagree. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I think, I think I completely disagree. He ruined bad taste. It's not even funny anymore, bad taste. I, I don't think there's anything in, in Liar Mouth that's actually bad taste. I think it's a strange story about extremes, but Marsha doesn't have bad taste. No one in it actually has bad taste. Trump had no taste. Well, Trump is the ultimate hair hopper. And a hair hopper is the biggest insult I can ever give. It's someone that always acts rich, doesn't really have money, and spends way too much time on their hair. I I never mention Trump in any of my movies or anything because or anything because it it dates it. It dates it. A political humor gets old really quickly if it's about one particular person. It dates the film. Like Pink Flamingos is you know, 50 years later, people are seeing it. So you don't want to date it. I think even when she, the first lady did those hideous Christmas trees that look like goth <laughs> Las Vegas and everything, but it wasn't really funny. It wasn't as bad as, as to start something new. It was just hair hopper taste, which is never funny. And it makes rich people look bad. It's hard to top Fran Lebowitz's line that Trump is a poor person's idea of a rich person. Um, well, that's true. Well, that's what a hair hopper is, yeah. basically. Or or somebody like I think the reason Trump doesn't want you to see his taxes is because he's broke. <laughs> oh, yes. It's absolutely a matter of pride. So yeah. I'm assuming that you don't have what we might call Von Meter issues, that when you've made fun of somebody and, the, and then they die. For example, I'm looking right now on my little... Like who? I'm trying to think. Well, I'm... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take your pick. Who have I made fun of recently that just died, you mean? Well, I, look, I'm looking at the thing you did. It was sort of a fake National Enquirer cover. It says, Joan Didion hits 250 pounds, and there's this kind of— <laughs> That was done before she died. I know I, I know that. I'm quite aware of that. But I'm wondering, I don't know, do you like—when she died, did you feel, oh, geez, maybe— No. No, I didn't I, think so. I, I didn't. I make fun of— uh, I talk about it in my show I do now. I make fun of someone's dead. I said that I was nominated for the Grammy for Best Spoken Word for my book, but Joan Rivers, that bitch, beat me because she died. Uh, she would say something like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she, was, she would be all right to say that. Yes. Yeah. Well, Joan, no, I didn't feel bad about that because basically all those people on the cover were people I liked. It was me imagining the National Enquirer if it was run for intellectuals, if it was all dirt on novelists and poets and stuff, what it would be like if the paparazzi chased them every day. Or, you know, I do still read the Enquirer and the tabloids because I get I get material from them. But Yes, I think um, that was an intellectual. I still think it would work as a magazine. It would be beyond Spy Magazine or one of those magazines. It would be where outside of, you know, some intellectual that just got a great review for their poetry stepped outside and paparazzi were trying to get a shot. So they gained 40 pounds this week or that one didn't have to die or, you know, the, all the regular Inquirer headlines. Right. Actually, there's one that says, help, I've got writer's block, and there's a picture of Joyce Carol Oates. So. Right. I think she could land that. She actually, I've actually worked with Joyce Carol Oates a few times, and she's funnier than people actually think she is. She actually... Oh, I always thought she'd be fun. Yeah, she has a real sense of humor. She told Playboy once, the thing I can never get out, that she even writes jogging. <laughs> I respect it. <laughs> Speaking of uh, you and Joan Rivers, you you're a voter in like all kinds of awards. You might be the only person who votes in the Oscars and the Razzies. Yeah, I know. I do vote for both. I vote. Let me say I vote for the Oscars, the Writers Guild, Directors Guild, SAG Awards, the Razzies, the Spirit Awards. I, the only one I don't vote is the Emmys. I guess I'm not on TV enough. <laughs> well, I was going to ask and you. I, it's, a, it's a real job because I do watch all the movies. And every year I put my 10 best list is in art form every year. And it's never the ones that get nominated for the Oscar. <laughs> Everything I nominated never get nominated. But I'm still a proud member of all those organizations. And so you get all the screeners and, and don't you have to like, you have to destroy the screeners after the season I, is over? Yeah, I did an art piece. It was a picture of me burning them all. And I'm in a tuxedo and I'm burning all the screeners. It's called destroy all screeners. That's what I'm saying. How do people destroy them? They're hard to destroy. You have to go to a shredder and, you know, it's a, quite a job to destroy all those screeners. 
And remember one year they busted people for it, for they would sell them at flea markets. And then they, I guess they had to go to the Academy Award jail and stuff. You no, know, I think they had Will Smith slap those people. Um, I don't know. The, Maybe. You, you mentioned you, you're not an Emmy voter. You memorably did appear, I believe, as yourself on The Simpsons. Hi, I'm John. Can I help you with anything? 50 bucks for a toy? No kid is worth that. Oh, but this is the Rex Mars Atomic Discombobulator. Don't you just love the graphics on this box? No. How can you love a box or a toy or graphics? You're a grown man. It's camp! The tragically ludicrous? The ludicrously tragic? Oh, yeah, like when a clown dies. Well, sort of. But you also, you know, one of the things people say now is, well, real narrative is moving over to eight episode, you know, streaming TV things. It's moving away from movies. I, I've never gotten the sense that you were attracted to that form. Well, I like it, but I mean, I think all movies are too long now. Why do they need to be eight episodes now? Every Academy movie is too long. They don't need to be two and a half hours long, all these movies. Uh, there's no such thing, especially if they're supposed to be funny. There's no such thing as a good long joke. I hate jokes anyway. I like wit. When <laughs> someone says, can I tell you a joke? I would say, please don't. Please don't tell me a joke. I, I know I watch television. I do. I watch some of them. More documentary types, I think. Yes, I still watch them. I go to both. I go to both. I actually think when I was growing up, yes, film people look down on TV. Now TV is sometimes better. So I, I go to both. This might be the one semi-serious thing that we talk about, or maybe we've talked about many serious things already. But, you know, one thing that you did do was repeatedly visit Leslie Van Houten, who was one of the Charles Manson followers in prison. She's been fighting for parole. You've endorsed that parole. I think Gavin Newsom just, again, rejected the state's parole board recommendation to release her. Could you just say a little bit about her and that and why it's important? Yeah. For the fifth time, she, the parole board that is parole, that is appointed by both the governors that have turned her down, Governor Brown and Governor Newsom, even though the parole board each time goes through the reasons he told her down because it's a terrible crime and everything. Well, yes, it is. And she agrees and she looks back on it with horror. She's been in jail 50 years. She was 19 when she met the biggest madman of crime history. And um, she's had a perfect time in jail for 50 years. I do visit her. I, I can't so much now with COVID because that made visiting terrible in jail. I think that she, everybody knows she is rehabilitated. She does not blame Manson. She blames herself for making him a cult leader. And I think the law is she should get out. And uh, there's only three states in America where they allow the governor to turn it down. It's California, Oklahoma, and Maryland, where I live. And they almost got rid of it here this year, but then it was put back in. The governor appoints the parole board. So give your parole board that you appointed the freedom to do it. Everybody knows she should get out. It's just who wants to be the one to do it. Right, there's and no I would never say that to the victims, relatives. They can't be wrong. They're not ever wrong, what they say. But I'm talking about it from a legal viewpoint that she got seven years to life was her sentence on her trial, the last one that was the only one that counts. And uh, nobody that's been in jail for 50 years that got seven to life that has a perfect prison record. I just think in fairness that she will disappear. You'll never hear from her again. She has a large support group that she has job offers. She will vanish, which is what she should do. Yeah, she's 72 years old right now. And there's a little bit of spoiler thing uh, that's about to happen if you're listening and you worry about that kind of thing. Watching the Tarantino movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, that must have been a very yeah. odd experience because uh, there's it was. The I think it's a great movie. Yeah. I, I think it's a great movie. And when he was making it, I called Quentin and before he picked up the phone, I know him. He said, I know, I know. <laughs> don't, don't, don't put Leslie in. My name is Lulu. This is Tex. We're going to be leading you on a great trail ride through the beautiful Santa Susana Canyon. But if that was true, what happened at the end of this movie, and I think it's a brilliant movie, Leslie's crime would have never happened because it was the second night. She wouldn't have gone. Yeah. These fucking hippie weirdos, they, 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 they broke into my house. They tried to kill my wife and my buddy. Jesus Christ, are you serious? Yeah, I'm fucking serious. Now, my buddy and his dog killed two of them, and then... Uh, Oh, shit, I, I torched the last one. Torched? Yeah, I burnt her ass to a crisp. <laughs> so I wish it had been true in a way. That way, it never would have happened. The second night would have never happened. 
Right. So we're going to take a little break here. We have a little bit of time left after that with John Waters. The novel Liar Mouth, a feel bad romance is out. You may own it in return for a certain amount of money outlaid. And we will come back and talk a little bit more with John Waters. We're back. It's time to say some thank yous. A special one goes to Jennifer LaRouche. She is the person who is producing this segment, and she's one of our newer freelance producers, and this is exciting. Also exciting to have Dylan Reyes on the board as our technical producer, and way back behind the scenes, Jonathan McPants is doing all kinds of technical wizardry and post-production and stuff like that, and Lily Tyson, our senior producer, is also hovering over all of, the, all of this in a more or less angelic way, so thanks to all of them. We're with John Waters, a writer director director and actor best known for classics like 1972's Pink Flamingos and, of course, Hairspray and Serial Mom and Cry Baby. I could go on and on. So there's so many things I want to ask you about. But since I am sitting here in Hartford, Connecticut, which is where people will move when Baltimore gets too expensive, they'll come to Hartford. <laughs> um, but I know that there is something that you do in Connecticut called Camp John Waters. Tell us yeah. about that. It'll be the fifth year this year. It's a it's in a it's in Kent, Connecticut, and it's a beautifully restored summer camp that began as a nudist camp. People come, they live there for four days, living the life of my character. Sometimes it's all a tribute to my movies. It's the most amazing crowd of people. People come from all over the world. People have gotten married at it. They bring them on buses with free liquor. Oh, it's great. Uh, we had t-shirts that say uh, Jonestown with a happy ending. And uh, it, 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 it kind of is. Then we have guest counselors. We've had Patricia Hurst, Kathleen Turner, Mink Stoll's there every year, Ricky Lake's been, Tracy Lords. This coming year, it's Debbie Harry and Colleen Fitzpatrick, who played, who became Vitamin C, the pop star, but she played Debbie Harry's daughter in Hairspray. So Mother Daughter Day is our theme maybe this year. I mean, it must be, this must be a, a special opportunity to meet even beyond the rank and file type fan, right? The kind of person who's there is somebody who has related to your work, maybe in a way that you couldn't have anticipated. I don't know if you can sort of talk no. about what that's like or who, who that tends to be. And they, they stick together, the campers, all year, because whenever I do my show anywhere in the world, if I say, are there any campers in the audience? Somebody always yells out, yes. <laughs> I test my material on them. I judge a contest where they come as the most obscure details from my movie that's really, really hilarious. Uh, but they have like arts and crafts where they make hate bracelets and they do all sorts of sweet things like slip under the door a night before you go to sleep. The ransom note from Serial Mom, which is I'll get you mm, pussy face. Um, they they really are, go into it with a great spirit. And people are intense together, gay, straight, every age is, you don't know, and everybody gets along. It's, it's really, really a great camp. And we had a terrible thing. When I went to summer camp, what I hated was we had a bowel movement chart where they put it up in the middle of the camp at every camp. So we had that one year even, and they got into it. <laughs> well, yes. And uh, I think I either read or heard somewhere that at least one camper has taken it upon herself to, to eat some dog poop as a tribute. Yes. To one person, she was waiting in line. And then she said, can I do one thing that I've always wanted to do? And I said, sure. She said, can I eat dog do in front of you? And I said, well, yes, you know, and she took it out a little scientific lab thing and ate it and everybody cheered. It was, it was lovely. And she had a good time. I don't know. I'm, I'm open minded. Absolutely. So one thing would be enough for most people, one thing of this type and magnitude would be enough for most people. Probably not for John Waters. So is Burger Boogaloo out in Oakland, is that still happening? It's still happening, but it's called Mosswood Madness now because there was some problem with a record company that had nothing in L.A. that had nothing to do with the people that run it in Oakland. Yes, the fifth year. It's in July, July 4th weekend. And then we're having another one in Halloween. It is great. It's a two day punk rock festival. And there are punks there from ages two years old to 70. Some punks are 70 years old now. And it's great to see them stage dive. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's it's really great because they hate everybody in the world except themselves. So I, I really <laughs> like crowds like that. So who's headlining this year? Do you know yet? Bikini Beach, Wanya and Kim Gordon. We've had we've had Iggy Pop. We've had Devo. Oh, it's really good. Really, really good. I saw somebody compare it to Coachella, and you said, I call it Cella Go to Hella. 
Well, maybe. I played Coachella myself, though. I did my comedy show there, a music version. I played Coachella. I played Bonnaroo. I played Fun, Fun, Fun. But most of them, they got so big, they don't have comedy anymore. You know, I want to talk about the comedy, the spoken word comedy stuff, too, because once again, you know, you have reached a point in your career, in your life, where you could just cruise around accepting honorary degrees from universities that you would have been kicked out of or never admitted to back in the day. I do that, too. I do that, too. (laughs) I know. I know you do that. But you do this spoken word stuff and you really work it. I mean, if you're going to Birmingham, England, you write a couple of Birmingham jokes or find out what the local porn theater is and work that in and practice it on the airplane on the way over. That's a level. Oh, I of, do. I, it's, a, yeah. it's a 70 minute monologue. I rewrite it once a year and then the Christmas one once a year too. So uh, yeah. And it's a 70 minute monologue that's completely memorized. I don't use any notes. I come out. Yeah. It's a big part of how I make my life. I do it maybe 40, 50 times a year. But that's a level of dedication and particularly, you know, kind of tailoring it or localizing it a little bit. So there'll be a joke that the people in Athens get or something. Something. Yeah, uh, I always work in. I always work in a local joke. Yeah, I think it's good. It makes people know that you're not coasting. You're not walking through it. And and yes, I, I think it's very important to do that. With the limited amount of time that we have left, you know, I feel like on the one hand we've made some pretty amazing strides in this society, in this culture, in terms of LGBTQ acceptance. I, you know, growing up, I remember being a kid growing up, and I would see like. I don't know, Paul Lind or Charles Nelson Riley on television. I, it didn't even occur to me that they were kind of supposed to be crypto gay or something. As a kid, that didn't really mean anything to me. This is so much more part of- Were the- you blind as a child? <laughs> no, I just didn't know anything. I didn't know it. I was an idiot. I didn't know anything. My parents eventually did you know, explain this whole thing to me, but it took a while. So yeah, no, I didn't get that. But now, obviously, you know, we've made all kinds of progress, but I feel like also there's a- Do you feel like there's a little a bit of boomeranging going on right now. We've got this Florida law. There's yeah, I have a whole thing about the don't say straight law that I want to pass in my show. <laughs> but um, I, I think, you know, no, I think gay people should scare straight people again. You know, I, I, and I know how to do it. And the main thing I've been recommending for a long time is if gay men and gay women started having sex, that would freak out the whole world. <laughs> but but does it concern you? I mean, I, you know, there's uh, there's more book banning and stuff like that. A new wave of that kind of stuff, a way in which the Republican Party seems to want to reignite the cultural uh, wars. I assume it's because they have so little else in their quiver that they want to get into all this culture stuff. I, I don't know. Is it just sort of more of the same or does it feel like a scarier moment? Well, book banning is the stupidest thing ever. That's the best press agent you ever had. I wish somebody would ban liar mouth. Really <laughs> oh, somebody me. will. Absolutely. I, I promise you that. <laughs> well, I don't think they're going to be teaching it in kindergarten. I, I don't really think that's going to happen. But at the same time, book banning, the whole thing of the, uh, you know, you look back on it, even Anita Bryant's career was totally ruined when she came out against gay marriage and everything. So it doesn't work. If you don't want something, don't go radically against it, then it just brings more attention to it. Now the fight with Disneyland and Florida at the same time, it's, you know, both of them at one point in their careers were on the same page. And then when Disney had to stick up for gay people, and I know why, they want to keep all their animators. They're all gay. (laughs) So as we're starting to wrap up here, in 2009, you're talking to Modern Painters Magazine, and you say, I want to do two more movies. That's enough. I hope I can make two more. How, how are you feeling about that right now? You don't sound like anybody who wants to retire or anything like that. No, well, you don't know. I've got some ideas in the works with studios now. I'm just not allowed to talk about it. So uh, I'm not saying I'm finished making movies at all. There, w- there was at one point some kind of, wasn't there like a Christmas project that was being kicked around? Yeah, for that's still possible. Yeah, there was a Christmas project. Plus, I've been paid a couple times to write sequels to Hairspray, which I did. So my movie career is not dead. I still deal with Hollywood all the time. And God bless Criterion, they put out, you know, this beautiful packages of multiple maniacs, pink flamingos, polyester, female trouble and now pink flamingos so they're really keeping my career alive in a very classy way so i think we have to salute the people that are still going back and doing extremes of movies they have bresson and bergman but at the same time they have me so they like extremes (laughs) and i think that's the most important thing 
Is there going to be a movie of Liarmouth? If they do, they have to buy the rights, don't they, to make it? <laughs> would Would you want to direct it? Would Would you dream of turning sure it over to anybody else? Yeah, sure I would. It would be NC seventeen, and it would have a lot of special effects. So, uh, but yes, I think maybe it's time to have an NC seventeen hit movie again. <laughs> uh, works for me, John Waters. It has been a privilege and a pleasure to talk to you today, and congratulations on the novel coming out. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Just be plain bad.